I will go right away and uh, introduce uh, our sister Jessie from Malawi to engage us into the political participation and we can take along um, the input oh, from Naki. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Phakta donut shabda. Jess is from Malawi and she is a member of parliament. Jessie, take it on. Good morning. Um, still trying to get used to this title they call honorable, whatever that means. Um, but I'm Jesse, and um, I'm here to talk about standing on principle, doing feminist politics, lessons learned from the trenches. But uh, before I do that, I actually just wanted to start off by remembering that as we are seated here, we're still missing the girls that went missing in Nigeria. And I think every time women meet, um, this is something which we should always uh, remind ourselves about. I also would like to say, I would like to preface my presentation by marking that it's a very crucial presentation given that this is 2015. I'm also going to go ahead and embarrass somebody. I know they will be like, how could you do that? But what often happens in feminist work, I think we've also become very good at lamenting and talking about problems. And sometimes we don't stop and celebrate ourselves. For me, being a feminist is something that I've been since I knew who I was. But there are people along the way who actually helped to give me permission to be who I am. And today, I would like to thank Agent Africa for inviting me to, for the first time, actually meet Professor Amina Mama in person. She's somebody whom I've wanted to meet, I've tried to meet, and um, I just wanted to say, sometimes in academia you do not know what you've done, but I think the greatest gift in life is to, I always say the longest journey for any woman is the journey to yourself. And for those who participate, to make you be who you are and help you know that you're not crazy, you're not mad, you know, even though everybody around you is telling you you're crazy, and then somebody says no, and they don't even know you. I think um, language is a very, very tricky thing. And to be able to, through your writing, actually reach out and speak to people through your divorce, through your PhD, whatever, through your marriages, goodness knows through what. I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Yeah. And um, I, I know that in Dana's remarks as you're writing for me to do this paper, you said you're going to speak just after Professor Amina Mama uh, speaks, and I was like, really? Uh, and then I saw that it was um, um, Professor Mago, uh, and she's still wonderful. Thank you. I'm so honored to meet you ladies. Uh, you've done so much. I'm happy that at least we are meeting in, you know, in place, and we can smell, stop and smell the coffee at times. Thank you very much. The other thing that I just want to quickly look at is to say, um, I would like to dedicate this presentation for me to the African-American diaspora Africa women. Um, I think throughout the movement, there have been a group that has been spoken for, forgotten, and reproduced in terms of um, operations. It's good that we are giving this a show of the global Africa. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for welcoming us. We rarely have these transnational links, but I think it is good to be home away from home. I was going to link my st to start my talk by saying, in my opinion, I think peace is overrated. Um, I'm, I know people have told you that I'm crazy. I'm saying that um, I, 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 I would, um, I'm, I'm linking this to my professor who's just spoken, because I think for us in academia, where we are very happy is where we differ, and then we start to see where we are going. In my opinion, I think being a feminist does not mean at no time shall I stand for militarization at all. 
I'm saying, yeah, I, I, I'm saying this because I think there is a, a danger sometimes of glorification of womanhood and linking us to be people who never can be violent. I, for one, I'm a woman, I'm a feminist, but I always tell people, if you step on me, I will beat you. <laughs> I'm not going to leave you. And the issue is very simple. I, for one, believe the movement has been, has been stalling because we've treated power as a cup of tea. It's not. If we are not prepared to grab this, we'll never have it. We will never have it. Until we treat the woman question as a political question, as something that one will die for, and something which if somebody continues to mess us up, they know it will cost lives. That, for me, I make no apologies for, and it's very simple. Last time I checked at colonialism, whatever isms, the only time they came to an end is when people saw that we are going to be killed if we continue doing this. I am saying this because I think, um, I really believe in peace, but I believe peace does not mean the absence of physical violence. Peace should start from absence of structural violence. I would like to start with, with burning every church that thinks I had to borrow someone's rib in order to be here. I for one feel that's where the problem begins. Because I don't think I owe anyone in anybody's rib. I'm a person in my own right. Okay? And if anybody is going to think that I'm going to be their member of a church on the basis of thanking men every day for having borrowed me their rib, they have something coming. You know, and not even frightening me that when you die, you, you, you will be bent or whatever. We'll meet it there. But I refuse. I refuse for me to be defined as someone's subset. Full stop. Okay? And I don't think it, it comes from any book or anything. It's how I feel. From the time I knew who I was, I believe female self-determination is a political feeling for me. And um, unfortunately, we live in a place where physical violence has a very high premium. Um, I was happy some people are citing Joyce Banda and what she went through. I've already asked Nana, we need to talk about the Joyce Banda phenomenon, because I think there's so many issues that I hear people talking, I'm like, which Joyce Banda are they talking about? But anyway, that's a story for another day. The point I was trying to say is I think we need to unpack the, militar the militarization and whether how, what does that mean in terms of feminist politics? Because I would like to think if I'm the president, um, I'm going to be commander in chief. Am I saying a feminist way to be a commander in chief is not to go into war? Or am I saying, and, and which is what I think Professor was working towards, that we should deal with the problems that are underlining so that we don't ever have to go into physical war or kill people? My issue is, meanwhile, what happens since we are not there yet? Do we say those who do say let's go to war are not feminists or do we say they are, not, they are being unfeminist? What is it? I think the movement needs to make time for that. Um, as you can see, you have a politician who was an academic and has, loves talking, but I've, I've been warned to stick to time. I promise you I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, my presentation today, um, I think it's very important for me to construct the basis where I'm coming from. I'm a member of parliament uh, from the opposition party, chair of the Women's Caucus for the Malawi National Assembly, and also the publicity secretary for the main opposition. But t t don't worry, I will not bash anybody, I'm away from home. Here everybody is good and the government is doing nice things. You believe, right? <laughs> okay. Um, from the top, when, you, when one says from the trenches, yes, <laughs> thank you. One would ask, wh what trenches, what principle are we talking about when you say doing feminist politics? What principle are we talking about? I think the context is very crucial. Why am I saying that? Especially because, and I think the, um, the, 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 the the esteemed scholars who presented before me did a good job to show that when we talk of democracy, we really are talking about democracy from other people. It's a cut and paste form of democracy. Democracy that are usually de not delivering to women. 
Especially, I was so happy when Professor Mago talked about land. Land is a serious, serious issue, especially where I come from. And the real issue being the whole concept of defining development from extractive concepts. Where people say, no, 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 a company will employ many people. And then you say, what about those people becoming landless? What happens? And they say, but those people don't know how to farm. It's amazing how African black people are seen as people who don't know what to do with the land. They are on land, eh? but they don't know anything. I don't know how that happens. Access to justice is another issue in this democracy. We have so many issues of access to justice. You know, and in general, spaces and voices of power in this democracy are just not, you can't find them for women. Service delivery, it, it's just something which you hear of. Now, I talked about the context. I'm coming from a place where there's been a lot of people celebrating that they're gender activists and people so afraid to be called feminists, right? Yeah, and I want to add that one of the major shocks I had was when I came to do my PhD here and I was chosen by you, by the African American Women's Organization and I was asked to go and give a talk and just before I enter the stage, somebody whispers, don't call yourself a feminist. They don't like it right here in the US, not anywhere else. So this fear of the big F is all over and I said, watch me. I'm going to tell them I'm a feminist so bad, they'll never forgive, forget me. <laughs> okay? Um, I, I think it's important. The principle uh, it, it, that I'm going to be talking about here is a feminist, undeniably, with a capital F, actually, of female self-determination, which does not aspire to be equal, but wants equity with that equality. I think mo most of the times, you know, people would say, don't you want what men have? I'm like, no. I don't want to be a man. I want to be better. I don't want to be like them. They've taken to this world, this world to two world wars. Who needs that? I think we can do better, you know? Uh, and, and if you're going to measure yourself with people who are failures, then you are doomed, you know? Now, why do we say this? African feminists are, have got this big job of showing that the personal, whatever it is unique to them, is, is actually political. Why is this crucial? Because the first thing they meet is exclusionist discourse. The discourse that says, but we are different. But we are different. Why do you want to be like them? You know? At the same time, the, you, you, you are meeting a patriarchal racist argument. Yes, there's part of you that doesn't want to be white and male. But there's part of you that wants to be black. But what is that in terms of gender? What is that exactly? So for, for African feminism, the issue of wh what I feel is political is very crucial. Now, this is very crucial to quote Edwidge Danticat, when home is where the oppression is. If home is where female genital whatever and this, this and that and that, but then even if when you open the door, you also see patriarchy mutating, you also see it fermenting, so you have oppression in Africa and outside Africa. All of it built, whatever economy people talk about, have been built on the backs of that African woman. All right? So in other words, issues of co the, the context of colonization, uh, global capital, very, very, very important. Uh, and also language. You know, you find that even just for me to call myself what I am, I have to decide his or her. You know, and, and I'm like, what kind of a language is this? Because in my own African language, I don't have that madness. But now you hear a table has a gender. If you try to go to French and whatever, and you're okay. So everything has a gender, including entities. Now, I'm not going to waste time because of um, time, but I just wanted you to see that as I'm talking, I'm going to be emphasizing what people like Okundipe Leslie have said. To say, look, if you're going to look for African women where they don't stay, you will not see them. You're going to think they're not talking. And often you'll hear people say, where did they do such a thing? What did you mean? And maybe sometimes it's because you were not looking for them where they reside. Okay? I will be talking, I, I won't talk much, but I, will, I would like us to keep in our mind structural violence and the whole issue of having to make our own tools because we can't use the tools of the master to destroy their own house. Um, now, 
Why would you want, why are we talking about the principle of feminist, um, the, doing feminist politics? You know, in order to fight the misogynistic patriarchal institutions that we've got for gender justice. Some, uh, I think the person who's just finished presenting said, it is the right thing to do, to transform the world, our part of the world, and the one beyond. Now, why would you want to do this? To change the identity of politics, the content, the processes, the language, definitions of power, curriculum, up to this day, majority of the curriculum in the continent and beyond teach women that they are second best. Who invested, who invented this, who did this? Most of the things talk are very, very patriarchal. And some of them, when you investigate, they really are very far away from the truth. From the truth. Look at our entertainment. Every time I watch Hollywood, and you, 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 you watch the storyline, it's about a woman who is so desperately in love with somebody. And she can't do anything with herself apart from surrender to this guy. You know? And when she has surrendered, what a wise thing to do. She'll be rewarded by a child and marriage, and everybody lives happily ever after. You know, now we've even been convinced to think that to be a woman means to give birth. What if you don't have children? Are you no longer a woman? What if you're different in terms of those issues? But that's not how we are looking at these issues. Now, I'm starting to say the politics I'm trying to, the principle is doing feminist politics that understands the diversity of women, that we are different. And just because we're different does not mean somebody is wrong. Because that's how, that was the basis of patriarchy, saying you are not a man, so you are not correct. And we need to be careful ourselves not to say you are not heterosexual, therefore you are not correct. Or you don't have a child, therefore you are not correct. You know, or, or you are not Zimbabwean, so you are not correct. Whatever it is, you know, not being prescriptive. We need to see that we are different. And here I'm not going to belabor the point. There's been huge debates. What is it to be a feminist in a Muslim world? What is it to be a feminist in a Christian world? That we are diverse. Even in personality. Sometimes we cannot stand each other. That's life, you know. Sometimes we are good people. Sometimes we are not, you know. And um, lived experience, education, there are all these differences that come. Now, one would say sticking to principle in the trenches. What does it mean? My point is to say, in a nutshell, it's daring to be different, to be at the helm, to be the best, to swim against the patriarchal current. When you run for elections, instead of being a secretary, you say, no, I want to be president. Uh, and so far, we've had two of them who've dared. I want to be judge. I want to be chief of police, army. I want to be a good mother. I want us to see what I'm aspiring for there. Not everything is about being president or being professor. Sometimes you just want to be at home and have your kids. We should be able to say that is what the person wants rather than saying, no, 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 you should want to be um, you know, a president. Um, some of the people keeping to the principle might be getting out of a child marriage. And just two days ago, I think you heard people talk about the bill that we passed. I had the misfortune, or is it fortune, to meet a child who is eight years old, rescued from a marriage, um, a married to a marriage from to a 64-year-old. Eight years old, married to a 64-year-old. Now she has gone back to school. Her battle is to go back to school. You know? She has gone back to school, and it's very good, very good news. Okay? Now, what tools are we using? The usual, that I've tried to put the education, employment, entrepreneurship, state politics, forming groups, um, and also the history, you know, indigenous cultural practice. Um, I want to emphasize this, that sometimes there is, tends to be a single story on the indigenous cultural uh, practices that they're just seen as negative. There are some that are actually positive and are also helping Africans to survive. This is crucial because if everything that is called ours is negative, then we have nothing to work, uh, to work with. And I wanted to register that some of the tools are from there. Another set of tools is legislation. For example, the passing of um, laws, like the one which we just had in Malawi. And uh, much as I don't have time, I'll just 
hasten to add that it was not a joke. It was very, very difficult because um, the law does have some gaps. I think those of us who have done legislation know, know that you know, it's very rare to get a law that is airtight. There will be problems here and there. It has been sitting on the desk for 14 years. So you can imagine what has been there. But it took a lot of working ruling party and opposition in order to get it passed. Now the pressure is on will the president assent to it or not. And you'll be surprised the kind of things people are angry about are married or rape. Married or rape. And you can imagine an African country getting that passed. It wasn't funny. And I remember at tea time when they were about to shoot it down, I said, I'm surprised you people want to rape your wives. I thought you want sex to be nice. What would be nice about raping anybody? So when we argued about that, finally one of the men got up and said, no, rape is rape. Even if it is your wife, she has consent. Well, the point I'm trying to see there, you'll see when we go to male involvement, that one of the major tools is actually working with men, but on condition that they should be sensitized, they should be people who are for women, feminist in perspective. Otherwise, they have a huge potential of derailing and dropping the, and, 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 and derailing the whole agenda. Yeah, I think conferences and agendas have talked about that. Now, one would ask, do you have an alternative model? I think the key things about the alternative model, the feminist model we're talking about, is that we must domestic, domesticate it. Feminism must be defined and located, domesticated to the people who are talking about it. Once in, a, I mean, so many times you hear gender, feminism, and you ask, what do you mean by that? They are giving you a definition of what was, what they read somewhere. Nothing that is owned. I've talked about the curriculum. They need to popularize this uh, model. And keyword, making sure that it is oral. Because majority of our people don't read and write. Use of music, oracha, and male involvement, as I've said. Rewarding sheroes and he for she identities. We've just launched a he for she campaign led by the president and is making sure that he's championing issues of women. Um, and then I've talked about political involvement. Now, women in politics, I'm coming to an end, just two slides to go. The question would be, who is getting into the politics? I want to say, unfortunately, majority of the people involved in politics are usually tokens. They are very tokenistic, and many of them are boys club members. There are people who have risen to how far they've gotten through the boys club, and they depend on the boys club in, in order for them to stay in, in power. And you see, most of them will say, I'm a gender activist. They will refuse to be called whatever, you know. And the feminists are actually ostracized and punished for any step that they take that pushes them. Um, and I think in this note, you can check what has happened in South Africa uh, in terms of the Zuma debate. And you can actually see the reward system that has followed through. There are some arguments that came out on the Zuma debate that left... <laughs> You know, you astounded. Is this a woman talking? And the next you're told it's a very good leader. Really? Uh, okay. <laughs> you know. So, I mean, in a nutshell, elitist, they behave like boys, and they have to prop up patriarchy in order to survive. And once they're propped, they are sold like hotcakes. This is the woman. You should all be like her, you know? And unless you know the background, you're not surprised. Um, this is very, very... Typical, because a lot of our democracies are using the poster approach that Europe and the West have used, where you need a poster child and you are given someone as a formula, yet women are what? Are diverse, okay? But there will be someone who is always on the posters and they are told, be like this one, be like that one, you know? And the challenge is, can Africa come up with a model that is our own? One that depends, I think the professor talked about, not micro, but the maze, right? One that is from the community. And it's not something which one person will say, I'm the one who did this. But it's something which everybody says we own, right? But that is not the poster approach that we've been given. Huh? Most of women are very happy to be vice this and vice that. I'm the secretary, you know, and look at the numbers. I want to add that yes, Rwanda is a success. I think South Africa has also improved quite a lot. But look at Malawi. We have gotten a serious backlash from 22 to 16 percent. 
We've lost a president. Right? And right now, everywhere you go, people will tell you women are not good presidents because Joyce didn't know what she's doing. As if she's the first one who didn't know what she was doing. You know? I always give the example of this place when Sarah Palin was running and she made all those blunders. People behaved as if no Bush had ever run here. I mean, there was Bush. Who was a celebrated problematic person mentally? But nobody said, you can't be president. Then Sarah Palin wants to be vice president. And everybody says, no, 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 we can't have someone like that. I used to ask, since when? Is it because of the gender? You know? The question is, we are seeing the same thing in my home. Uh, key thing, which here I have not blown up, but I want to make very clear. The backlash is really there, and the main battlefront is the quota system. The issue of affirmative action. Some of us are fighting every election. I've just submitted a paper to Namibia where I was arguing for affirmative action. We are also battling the same thing in my home. If you ask me now, the structure of patriarchy cannot be combated if we do not construct a structure to combat it. It can't be wished away. And so the issue of the quota is is really helping. Countries that have adopted quota system, on average, are really having many women there. I know many people will say, what if we get the wrong women? We have so many wrong men. There's no problem. <laughs> get people there. Okay? There's nothing to worry about at all. And as far as I'm concerned, you have affirmative action. You can also back it up with programs to make sure the women who are there are actually fortified. So there is a way out. It's just about us making a case. Um, and I want to say the other issue in, my, in, in, in Africa is the way donors are getting caught up in the politics. It's not br brilliant, but most of them find themselves supporting so-called, oh, we are neutral. I want to say I'm yet to find a neutral person. Usually neutrality means we are supporting the status quo and those of you who are trying to get the status quo out better find someone else to help you. But as far as we are concerned, we are supporting. Now sometimes the status quo can be a problem to women. Um, I'll end by saying uh, challenges I've told, uh, uh, I think I'll, I want to, yeah, I'll just quickly say. Um, the key thing, which is what I think I started on, is about reconfiguring power. And my issue, and I've said this because it has been a battle for me, for my life, can power be defined in any way that is not adversarial and be powerful? This is a question that I would like all of us to think about. Uh, I'm saying this because we always say depatriarchalize, depatriarchalize, but really, what does that mean? Okay? Um, and I think adv uh, exposing advantages of our model would help and illustrate that there is enough power for us all. It doesn't mean that when women of Africa uh, and, and women in the world get to be powerful, then men are going to suffer. In other words, just because Jesse is empowered, it does not mean any of the private parts will fall off. I always say that at home. I tell them, you will be intact. Nothing will drop. Even after meeting me, it's true. I am telling you this because people look at women's empowerment as a demascul as an emasculating exercise. Huh? That the minute I'm powerful, it means the man has become a woman, as if being a woman is a crime to start with. And secondly, as if I'm going to take anything away from him. No. You know, it's just, it's just very, very simple. So um, I'm going to end finally by saying, Sticking to the principle, the feminist principle, is very costly. Whether you are in academia, whether you are in a, a entrepreneurship, wherever. Because there is a reason why somebody says I'm a feminist and not just a gender activist. What they are saying is, for me, women's empowerment is a political statement. It is something that I believe in. I believe in a movement, and I believe in doing whatever it is that I can do. And that, that's costly, because when you contest power, it what? It fights back. It's not going to smile, because they know that I'm, I'm getting chipped away. Women in politics are suffering a backlash, and I'm saying this, as you, believe it or not, even my being here, because of being a member of opposition and being called a so-called feminist, right now the headlines at my home are saying, Jesse has gone to meet her fellow feminists. And you know what feminism means to most people? 
women who hate men. And I'm like, I've been married so many times. How can I hate people? <laughs> I don't hate them. I just don't like fools. That's all. <laughs> you know? That's all. I don't hate anybody. <laughs> you know? And I'm just being very honest. I don't think refusing to be with trash means you hate anybody. It just means you've got principles. Simple. You know? And you try your best. And some people stick to the madness, to their death. That's their problem. Now, I was, I'm explaining this because everywhere, you are, and I know it might come as a joke, but I'm telling you, for a feminist, any position you occupy, I thought becoming a politician would give me lots of leeway. But I'm telling you, every step I go, I am asked even by my own members of the constituents, we hear that you are a feminist. Is it true? And I say, yeah. And then I'm called, do you know that people will not vote for you? Because of that, I said, well, the question is, I wouldn't change who I am, so they might as well not to, you know? The point I'm trying to explain is, this is a costly identity. Be it in US, be it wherever, it's, it's, it's a global problem. I've said um, tokenism, the danger is for us to become tokens. Even in workshops, conferences like this, you can come here and say exactly what they want you to say. And you'll be rewarded for it. But remember, we are here mainly to open doors, not close them. Now, need to define the fight from the structure. Attack institutions that are housing and peddling patriarchy, such as religion, marriage, African cultural practices, global capital, capital issues of labor, unions, media, parliament, cabinet itself. There, I just thought I'll give you just a, a, a bird's eye view. When we touched on the marriage law, they would have roasted us because you don't touch marriage. That is, that is the most sacred institution for patriarchy. And they will give you a rant for your money. Because they will ask you, what are you talking about? Where did you come from yourself? If it wasn't for marriage, what would you be? What does the Bible say? What does the Quran say? And you find yourself, huh? huh? And then finally you say, oh, watch what I say. That's what's going to happen. What I'm saying is all that you're saying doesn't make me feel happy. And if you want me to be part of this, I think I'm a person, right? That's why I say to me, the principle is female self-determination. And that is to me, as feminist as it gets. I want to thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Uh, forgive me for my theatricals. I've tried to be as <laughs> clear as possible. But thank you so much to me. I've never attended the Beijing, by, by the way, uh, CSW, because every time this conference came, I would have insulted the government in some way, or I've done something that the government doesn't want, so my name is removed. So for me, this conference is very special. That <laughs> not only have I come, but I've met you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, just and her reputation for being mentored by Professor Amina Mama. Because you can't be mentored by Amina and not speak up what is in your mind honestly. Because that's what she does. And so I can see the connection and the acknowledgement. And I just want to thank you because I think what you've done is you've said, let's not leave anything unquestioned. And let's not be intimidated with each other's views. We can put all of them together both in an academic sense, in a, uh, in a uh, shall I say, um, uh, but also in a way of honesty and accountability. So that once they're on the table, then we know the kind of things that we want to discuss. And so I want to thank you for that. And I know that you're dying to engage her. And we have good 15 minutes, which we can use very effectively. So let's get started. We're gonna engage her with questions, with the interactions, but don't make her speech. Please, that is not a feminist way of speaking when you make somebody else's speech. You take it and repeat it and so on. You're going to have to put what your input is and so that she can interact back with us. And so I am going to take your question first because you've been handling that microphone and asking me to give you space. So why don't you put your question first? All right, thank, th you. thank you so much. My question is around the costly identity of being a feminist. There's so many contradictions that come with that, especially in the political space. How do you deal with that? 
because you need to be true to yourself, but there are also so many expectations around that. How do I cope as a young feminist leader? Okay, our speaker would like to have three questions and then she answers and then I'll take the next three. Okay. So Grace has actually stolen my question. Well done. <laughs> Let me add to it, um, just to a bit. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jesse. You're terribly generous to this recalcitrant professor. Thank you. <laughs> and I feel very proud, but I also feel a deep sense of responsibility, which is where my question is coming from, um, which is to ask you, can you tell us a bit more about how civil society and women's movements can support women when they do get into power? Because we realize we've pushed women to power and then we're not there to defend them. And if they become isolated, some of them are just queen bees on their way up. But to those who care like yourself, we have a responsibility. So I'd like to know what kinds of support will help you in the, the fray that some of us would not dream of entering. So thank you for your bravery and the anti-child violence bill. Fabulous. We want it in Nigeria. Yeah. yeah, and while on that, also deal with the question about what about if they are in power and we disagree with some of the things that they are doing? Because you did mention some of that and I have had it now over with the fact that we do have some women uh, president as well. And the third question, which is yours, and then we'll, she'll answer those first. I think it was her Sorry. first. I'll take you next. And then, okay. I'll let you ask that question. Okay, thank you so much. I, I have been looking at, I, uh, my name is Victoria, I come from Nigeria, and I've done a bit of work around some of the conversations we're having. I think there is also a part of the information about women empowerment that doesn't come out in conversations like this. And that is the political participation of women in probably pre-colonial Africa and post-colonial Africa. In pre-colonial Africa, women were very powerful. Women had powerful political institutions. Democracy destroyed those institutions. No matter how powerful a king is in traditional African setting, there are so many things a king cannot legislate upon. Market days, things about children, reproduction, there are so many things, no matter how, even the most despotic king, things affecting women, he will not dare make any legislation that will bind women. Women had a separate political identity, and that was why there was a mad rush to be the wife of a king because that was also a very powerful stool. Very powerful, the queen was as powerful as her husband. So, so the question really is that, I hear a lot of oh, the oppression, 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 oppression. There are also some strong parts, like how democracy destroyed those institutions and rendered women totally subordinate to the men. And women, now, what actually is the source of the oppression? We don't seem to be interrogating that problem, the real cause of women's subjugation in African societies. All right, thank you very much, and congratulations, my sister. We are behind you. Um, just wanted to ask, you're in the midst of attention in your country, and even the rest of Africa, women politicians, with you some time in Malawi, Dana was there, I remember. We were many women from Africa. We came there, many of us, hoping to see your president and hoping she will just come, not only to open, but even to have a meal with us. And the young women would see what a role model, what an African, what a, a, a woman looks like to be a president. In other words, we are all coming to shake her hand, to tell her we love you, we support you, and show us how you came here. She didn't come, not even to open the conference, not even to have a cup of tea with us. Where does accessibility go when women become somebody, when women become powerful? And what are we talking about today? Thank you. Thank you. I think because of the numbers, if I quickly answer this, then maybe we can have a quick uh, round again. Um, how do I deal with being a feminist? My answer is very simple. I don't know what to be anything. I don't know how to be anything else. 
So I think when you ask this, it's like how do you, you know, like all my life I've been fighting being fat. And uh, I grew up in Zimbabwe. And the time I was growing up there, it was the time when people were very slim. And I remember I reached a point where I had tried dieting, I had tried whatever. And then I said to myself, look, if someone doesn't like what they're seeing, they can close their eyes. And since then, I am so liberated, I have no headaches. Even when a guy comes to me and he says, I wish you were small, I just say, pass next door. Whoever knows what to do with this body will find me. Simple. Okay? The point I'm saying about feminism is, for me, it's about, a, it's a human right belief. It has not been easy. It has cost me a lot. It has been very, very problematic. Even my stay in the U.S., there is a time things went wrong with my social security card, and I was asking, and for the first time I met people who were saying, this is the government that has done this. There's nothing we can do. I said, hey, in Africa, we have the government for lunch. What are you talking about? The government makes a mistake. We are going to ask them. We hold them accountable. Why? I believe in my rights. So if you say, how do you do it? What I will say is, I have a strong belief that being brave does not mean you don't fall. It just means you get up every time you fall. So I will lie, I will lie to you if I say there have not been moments when I was afraid, when I regretted, when I wished I could shut my mouth, when I missed a, a guy that I really liked because he, he discovered how, how much of a self-determined person I am. Yes, there are roads I wish I had taken that I couldn't because of who I am. But I'm much proud that I've been myself. And all I'm saying is it ain't easy, but you stick to it. Because that's the right thing to do. And now I'm happy when I see other people who come to me and say, you know, I'm happy to, if you did this on this day, that day I had to do, blah, blah. I've also uh, helped other people find their feet. And that's what keeps me going. But I would say key thing that has helped me, having parents who are very, very gender sensitive and supportive of feminist ideals has really helped. I come from a home where my father is very much, you can do anything you want. My mother is very much, stand for what you believe in. The other thing is education has really helped. But I want to be honest with you. I am not one of those people who prescribes education without self-belief. You can be as educated as you are, but if you don't believe in yourself, you'll be the first one to surrender your salary to your husband and remain with nothing. I want to argue with you now, argue to you, put it to you. My whole PhD is showing that the most oppressed is the educated woman. Because she has got all the patriarchies coming to her. So, first, you, yourself, must. This, that's why I've talked about female self-determination, then add education. Also, parentage helps. That helps. Um, how can civil society support? I think to me it's about one, build, what I miss as a political entity now is capacity, is organizations to help me avail, you know, capacity. Like I lead 32 women in parliament. Some of them, when they stand up to talk, we all look for the nearest hall to look at because they're scared. They, they don't know what they're saying. But I also believe that they are saving Malawians. That they don't know how to speak English should not be a crime. But they are in a parliament that says, you don't know how to speak English, then you are nobody. The, 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 the neoliberal framework she was talking about, the colonialism, all of that. So what I miss is being seen to be the link between the activist world, I was in the academic world, where a good number of them go and get educated, they get opportunities, and they also grow to understand that their job is not to give handouts to people. Their job is to do legislation, you know? So now, unfortunately, this is a political world. You are fought whenever you stand for this. So for me, it is about a capacity, building capacity. They should know what is feminist theory. What is gender? You know, what do we mean when you say a woman is made? You are not born. What do we mean by that? And how are they in their constituencies looking at this? How can they deal with the sexuality issues in a country that criminalizes this? And if someone is caught, instead of them rushing to say, uh huh, these are beast dogs, throw them away. They should go and get a book and find out and see that, oh, Africans have had this. 
and not, 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 not buy the story that they just told. They should go and do their own reading. Be, and I don't care even if after their reading they don't agree with what I've said, but at least take a position after reading. That's, to me, that's what I, um, my, my journey. So civil society, to me, it would be that. Doing what I'm doing here, but opening channels for other people. Because as for me, I've been there, I've done that, but then I need to make sure that before I leave this, at least those who have, can hold their own, you know, and, and, and be politician. Um, what if women are in power do something we disagree with? I want to say, I'll give you a clear answer. When Joyce Banda was in uh, power, we differed with me. If you came to Malawi, they were going to tell you that this is one of her bitter, most bitter enemies. I wasn't her enemy. To me, I took it that one of the concepts of sisterhood is being honest enough, like you've seen me here. If I agree with you, I'll say it. If I disagree with you, I'll say it. And that doesn't mean I hate you, all right? It doesn't. But when she herself stands up and says, oh, that girl, that was talking to you, she has been divorced three times. What has that got to do with the politics? Huh? And I, I got up and said, Madam President, let's look at your last policy speech. Don't worry about how many times I've been married. It's got nothing to do with your governance. And I gave in what I thought should be done in government and said, if I am president, this is how I'll do this. I took the story right from the personal politics to the country. Hmm? But I want to say, even me, there are times because of being a political person, I will take a position that you people will be shocked by. Because being a politician is being part of a certain machinery. The issue now is, can I maneuver from that space to make sure that the machinery is doing justice to women? And that is not something that is done in one day. It's a give and take process. Sometimes I might win this battle, sometimes I might not. Okay? I'm explaining this because I know when oppression wears a dress, it really becomes confusing. Most people sit there. I know times when America stood up and even Hillary Clinton was saying, uh, we are going to, what, what do you call it, Afghanistan? Hey, women are suffering. I'm like, yeah, they started suffering yesterday. Where were you when all this time? But you need to listen with a layered ear. There are some things you might be able to work out on the way to that because ours is a movement that is entering patriarchy from the back door. And for us to maneuver to the able to enter in the front door, it's not going to be an event. It's a process. So to me, remember, pro politics is politics. We are not going to agree with each other every day. In fact, to me, I feel the minute feminism is defined as us agreeing, we've stopped thinking. That's not what feminism is. We should be prepared to differ. All we are trying to do is let's find every way to support each other. Well, women were powerful in Africa. In fact, um, my sister always just contributed. That is the whole debate that you heard me pay homage to <laughs> Professor Amina Mama. I think you've seen the debate between Zegu Oyeronke on one side and Amina Mama and uh, Elaine Salos on one side. And the issue is, is female oppression a foreign thing? And my answer is, it's not. There is oppression that is ours. There is oppression that we, that was the one you've talked about. Where, and you are very right, in the past. But I think two things. Do not, uh, be careful not to globalize Africa. Because there are some places women were not as powerful as you are saying. They were some places, yes, they were. And I think in our discourse, we should be very careful not to end up thinking that because women had powerful spaces, pre-colonial Africa, it means patriarchy was brought to Africa. Because remember, they were still being buried with chiefs. Hmm? As like in my culture, a, a, a chief dies. With Mitsamiro, would you have that when the chief goes, he needs to have something to what? To, to, to lay his head on. And it was never a woman, a, a man. It was always women. Polyandry. Uh-uh. Go and ask. Find out. But polygamy. Ah, uh, no. We are fine. In other words, there are some of us. I come from a place that says, yes, women had more positions of power in pre-colonial Africa. But that doesn't mean they were powerful. 
Because we need to discover which power are we talking about. Are we talking about power with? Are we talking about power over? Which power? And for me, my sister, it's very simple. As soon, as long as I lay down with a man, I get pregnant. For nine months, I can't even walk. And I don't even have the right to name the person. I don't think I'm powerful. I am sorry. Because when I think of the pains of childbirth, to imagine I have to carry someone and say, come and see your thing. What you thing? When it is me, who has stitches all over, and I don't even have the right first name. Sometimes he gives it. Last name, his. And me, I'm labeled like a kind of whatever. I'm now Mrs. Goodness knows whoever. And then I have to tell people, if you get divorced, I'm the one who used to be Mrs. Hi. Anyway, let's not get whatever. So I, I hope I've, uh, I've explained what, what, what I'm trying to say. So you are right. We did have more spaces, but I don't think in all, all, all the places. How did democracy destroy? Yes, it did. I, I, I want to agree a lot. Yeah. But I would also want to add there are indigenous institutions that also destroyed women's powers. A lot of them. And those are the ones which some of us are saying we've got to look at them. I think in terms of the questions that, uh, where was Joyce? Yeah, I think last meeting of Agent Africa, I actually started off by offering an apology. Because what our president, the then president did, I am we're very sorry about it. It was rude, it was unfortunate, but I must say, you caught her at a time when she was at a very low part politically. The, I think if you saw the headlines just before, you could have seen. But not, that was no excuse. She should have come. And you people came at a timely part, and I think that brings me to the question she asked. One of the things that you guys did that we, could, we failed, which if professor can get it, and even the other professors listening, one of the things we women suffer from when we're in power is the way we talk, language. Language becomes, uh, Joyce was criticized for being emotional. That when she talks and she gets angry, she, you know. So what I did at that time, because I happened to hold these influential positions, I actually wrote and said, much as we differ in terms of politics, I would like a set of women to go and see her, to train her in speech, eh? because I didn't want her to be crucified for something that I know that as a woman, we speak from our emotions. And I'm one person whom in parliament, if you had the last sitting, I told them I'll be emotional, I'm a human being, do not. In fact, I've gone through all my success because I'm emotional in what I do. Don't make me feel guilty for being emotional. But some people, you know, when you've been a professor at university, you have a certain license, right? To say all of this, which other people don't. We asked people to go and she refused to meet them. She downright refused. One of the major problems with our president of that time is she didn't like professional women. That, even as minister of gender, she did not like professional women. So that's why I think you've heard me when, when I hear people say, oh, people didn't support me. The question is, did you support them? Well, you know, I mean, imagine a whole organization, Agent Africa, and you are the only people who came, and she doesn't even show. And what was funny is your color, the color of, your, of Agent Africa, is actually the same as the color for her party. And when you guys came, people thought you had conspired with her. And meanwhile, they had been dumped. And people thought that they had, been, you know, they had worked together. So I want to thank you for coming. Because remember, I always say, and I'll end by saying this, we are not in this for the personalities. We are here for the voiceless. Who will never come to Harvard Law? That's why we are here. We are here for those whom when we speak, when we write a good proposal, we'll go and dig water. And they'll get water and the child will go to school early. They'll never be written on any paper. So for the sake of that, please don't feel that your efforts fell on deaf ears. You're coming. Look, people like me really appreciated that meeting. And the people in the villages that we serve, they know that there is an, a woman organization that came to hold the hand of their sister. The fact that she didn't is a problem, and we offer sincere apologies. We hope it will not happen again. Thank you. Thank you. What a good place to stop. So, this is, this is how I stop. You stay on. This is how I stop. Whenever there is a hand, and there are not too many, I just ask them to table their questions, and I won't be asking you to respond, because I know that these questions are being processed, and the answer doesn't lie in her, but the answer lies in processing. So there are two hands there, 
And I'm going to let those two hands ask, and then I will close. Because we, have, we want to keep time. We don't want it to be said just because we came from Africa. We don't know what time is about. So you are going to be disciplined, and you will only say what's on your mind. Don't make a speech. OK, quite quickly. One, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, my, my sister. What I want to find out is uh, uh, how do you people as women in parliament relate across the political party divide? Okay, and then secondly, uh, have you been able to mentor some young people? You know, okay. you know what's on her mind? Farai Kundan again. Um, thank you so much for your honesty. Um, th that's what I took out from your presentation is your brutal honesty. You mentioned uh, in your presentation that sometimes you might take a position that would shock us because you understand that as a, a politician, you're part of a machinery, and I get that. However, earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned about, uh, you talked about women that were part of boys' clubs. What is the difference between you taking a position because you understand that you're part of machinery versus these women that could potentially be part of a boys club and in, in fact are um, taking us back as far as feminism is concerned. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Jesse. I think I, I enjoy every time listening to you. It was very, very good. Um, I want to bring to the issue of the women's movement and what has been taken out the women political uh, leaders. Most of them are seen to be the ones who should be taking the leadership when it comes to the women's movement. And I've seen that in Kenya. There's so much hope and a lot of faith in women leaders who have now gone into political positions. I would want to know the kind, and I think this goes back to all of us, where, where is the link? How are we able to support each other? I think that question also came because we are quite separate when it comes to politicians and those who are in leadership. And lastly, um, <laughs> I, I think one thing that is, um, I, I, I know you are an academician from your background, but I think we are lacking that support system of research that helps the women leaders to actually make uh, policy influence that is, uh, is factual and more, you know, with tangible facts that facilitate that process. <laughs> Jesse, uh, what is so refreshing about listening to you talk is that you're one of those rare ones who's willing to get out of the box and who's willing to dare to be different. I listened with interest to you support the quota system and lament the uh, decline in numerical numbers of women in politics. And I think that one of our biggest challenges going into post-2015 is how we balance this issue of numbers and beyond numbers, and how we begin to campaign not just for women in politics, but what kind of women, and are they willing to make a difference? And at the risk of talking out of turn, I just want to put one example on the table that arose from this morning. We heard about the common African position uh, on the post-2015, and we had two very powerful women who oversaw that process, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma. But how does it happen, I ask myself, that two very powerful women like that oversaw that process, and we have a common Africa position that does not have a standalone goal on gender equality. When the whole world is saying we need a standalone goal on gender equality, and we have these two very enlightened women who oversee that process, and we don't get that standalone goal. Thank you. Wow. I know, I know. No, I think I'm not going to go very far. All I'm saying is, um, I think you saw me in the morning when there were talks of um, that we are making strides in the AU. I'm, for one, I'm not afraid to tell you, I'm not amused at all. And the issue is simple. I'm expecting us not to be doing business as usual. Yeah, there are issues that have happened that I expected to see us put our footprint. In other words, I'm yet to see a feminist footprint from the AU. I haven't seen it. And at the risk of not being very loved, but whatever. That's how I see it. Number two, I think the other ones, I'm not going to attempt the issue about the difference between boys club and whatever. You are very right. This is how most of us politicians end up moving from the movement to, the, to become part of the furniture. The challenge is to be pre how prepared are you to lose politically and stand out as um, somebody who is not part of the boys club?
Okay? In other words, it's a delicate dance. Uh, I think we should see that a politician is not one thing. On this position, you'll be happy with me. On, and it's my job, but the total sum, you must be able to look at me and say, yes, she's standing for women. Like on the women's, um, the, the marriage bill. By the day it ended, my party, about three quarters, threw me out and said she has been bought. In my country, we say bought. She has been paid. They've paid her money. And unfortunately, I was buying a car at that time. That didn't... <laughs> That it didn't help, all right? So the point I'm trying to explain is, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing, and I want to tell you people, the most thing that can kill you when you're a politician and a woman is stress. I think you have seen, I've come here, I wasn't even feeling well. I know why, the two bills, human trafficking and um, the, the marriage age bill were a nightmare for me. But for the first time, the government had to depend on me much as they, they don't like me. That's why now the last minute night, they say, oh, we are going there. They're going to be thanking us about the marriage bill. You need to be with us. I had to last minute be with them because I knew what that would mean in future. So, yeah, it's a delicate dance. And I think the issue of, um, I think it was a boys club you've asked. The others, I'm, I think I've, I've, I've lost them. I didn't keep them in my mind but I can talk about them at lunch. I did want us to end, because you know what, a politician always get their way. Uh, on one end, I love this. That's one thing I love about politics. Um, I, I'm going to make a tribute to all of you because honestly speaking, this has been a long journey for me. I have fought so hard against politicians, I never thought I would be one. <laughs> but then after leading the academic freedom struggle for so long, I reached a point of it was one to one of me leading academic professors, and I defeated the president. And the political capital I got from there said, it, I always say politics called me, it's not like I went to them, right? But the women's movement is one thing that right now, there was a whole article I told them, I can differ with a person, but when it comes to women, I don't care what party you are, we have to work together, okay? So I'm going to say, when I sing, it's not going to be long, Zigamate means if things go like this, you say, ee ya all right? Zika matere de re de re, ee Zika matere de re de re, zoso wa. So that means if it's like this, here I means wow. You know, it's like you are lamenting, eh? Zoso wa means it's not every day. Then I'll say, lero rimenero, that means today. Today, am I, or the woman, is government, okay? That's what the song I'm going to sing to you, right? And you can just chill and listen, or you can join. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Ziga matere de re de re iya i. Ziga matere de re de re zoso wa. Ziga matere de re de re iya i. Ziga matere de re de re zoso wa. Lelo limene lo lelo. Lelo limene lo lelo. Lelo limene lo lelo. Amai abepa. Much as, thank you, you, thank much as you, you can't thank understand, you. it was to say today, woman is on top and woman is government. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. That's what they call incorporating our own style. Even when we are in a different space, I doubt that people dance and sing in this hall. But so this is what we bring to this hall. So we're going to go for lunch, and I want to ask our sister there to give us some instructions. So I thank you all for listening carefully. I thank all the two panelists and all of the people that have uh, given questions. We are in a good place to really continue this discussion in the afternoon and, and tomorrow. Mm. We, have, we have it out. Mm. We are out. We've come out mm. with what we want to talk about. Mm. So let's take this seriously just to the next stage. And thank you for the opportunity to facilitate this morning. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much, Duna, for that. Thank it's really you. great. Thank you. Thank you.